So Jeff, tell me, what does it mean to be a patient advocate? For me, it's really about getting people in my particular disease community to live a little more publicly, a little more engaged with their disease. I come from a patient community where it's possible for people for a long time to ignore their condition, which probably isn't so rare if you look at what happens to people in diabetes and other things like this. I never want to tell people how to live with their disease, but I want to tell people to live you know, openly and engage with the process of science research that's happening around the disease now. Now, you are a patient advocate, primarily in the area of Huntington's disease. Can you share with me how that came to be? When I was a child, I had never heard of Huntington's disease. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly rare disease. There's something like 30,000 patients in the U.S. probably. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up never hearing the word. It's a bit silly because my grandmother was sick, I mean, very sick, and ultimately hospitalized in a nursing home while I was young, but we just didn't talk about it. And I probably should have asked why she was there, but didn't, and you know, the way families were. You were just a kid at the time and didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know. Grandma was sick and it was scary, and yeah. after not very long they stopped taking us to visit her because mm -hmm. it wasn't any use, mm -hmm. and so it just kind of fell out of my brain, and then I sort of left home and joined the Army and was in fact overseas and found out when I was home on leave that on Christmas that my mother was not only also at risk, in fact my grandmother's disease was genetic, but that my mother was actually showing symptoms. And mm -hmm. so that's the first time I really mm -hmm. as an adult consciously heard mm -hmm. of Huntington's. And I now had just gotten married, so I was 19, I'd gotten married, just turned 20, was home, and, and then everything changed because my dad uh, sat me down and said not only is your mom at risk, she's sick. Can you tell us how that impacted your life and what changes you made and, and, and where you are now as a result? My initial reaction to finding out about the disease in my family was being very angry, of course, and all that kind of mm. stuff. But then I got very curious because I just needed to know what that meant. And there was very bad information available to lay people. And so when I got out of the Army, I started taking science classes and, and found them not just for my own need, but generally really fascinating. So I, I sort of accidentally found out that I really enjoy this mm -hmm. kind of science. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, well, I'll just keep going, you know, and I'll quit when it gets too hard or when I can't think of what I'll do with it. And it never did. And so I finished my bachelor's and then immediately went into my PhD with Michael Hayden, who's a very prominent clinical and basic researcher in the field of Huntington's disease based in Vancouver. Subsequently did a postdoctoral fellowship with Marcy McDonald here in Boston at Harvard Medical School. And then now took my own faculty position, setting up my own lab. So basically I've, I've followed that kind of initial curiosity through sort of all the phases of becoming an academic. You went from a kid in the army and now you have your PhD and you're a professor and you're studying the disease area that has impacted your family. If you read the introduction to any science paper on Huntington's disease, it says it's a fatal, dominant neurodegenerative disease, with no cure. That's, that's mm. the sort of standard. Very grim. Very grim. Uh. Uh, in fact, while there is no cure, there are pretty good treatments now, much better than there used to be for, say, the psychiatric and other symptoms that come along with Huntington. So the, the quality of life of people with Huntington's is better, although they don't have hope yet of a cure. On the cure side of things, there's also amazing things happening. There's incredible effort thanks to an energetic patient advocacy organization that's putting in a lot of money and a lot of expertise into getting drugs developed. They're working with pharma and biotech, as well as trying to get the patient community engaged and involved in trials. I've just come from a, the World Congress on Huntington's Disease, mm -hmm. which is a biannual meeting, and, and progress is remarkable. 2014 and 2015, there'll be multiple trials started, mm -hmm. not just with drugs that are repurposed or, hey, this might work for Huntington's disease, but drugs that are developed for Huntington's disease that have a real shot of being disease modifying, actually changing the course of the disease. All of them won't work. But then there's progress, the there's real tangible progress. Absolutely. Excellent. Is there anything else you'd like to highlight or tell us about that you're working to help move drug development along, move a cure along? Yeah, so for me, especially in a rare disease like Huntington's disease, in particular a disease that doesn't have pediatric onset, so you have a long prodromal period, you know, before you have any manifest symptoms, it's easy for people to stay away, to, you know, avoid the dark stuff that is around the disease and not be engaged in it. So I, I uh, along with a colleague, Ed Wilde, at University College London, have, have started a sort of a patient education service online to teach patients about what's happening in HD research. And so this particular example is called HD Buzz. We have a website, hdbuzz.net. Our content goes to all the lay organization websites and so on. And basically the idea is we take what's happening with 
clinical and basic research and rewrite it in a language that the families can understand and post it out. All the stories are written by clinicians or, or scientists who sign their names, so their you know, reputation is mm -hmm. on the line. So the idea is that, look, you can't be part of the cure for Huntington's disease unless you're in clinical trials. You're not going to know about clinical trials unless you're engaged in what's happening. You need to be aware of what's coming. And you can't just wait for them mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. set up clinical trials and then wait for the cure. Like your you the patients are part of it. So we've been really, really proud and excited about the progress that's made and, and we think it's gonna really help get people engaged in clinical trials. Okay, terrific. Well, Dr. Jeff Carroll, thank you very much. You're welcome.